Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the holy, holy Church of God, that our God and Lord may give her peace and unity and preserve her throughout the world, making subject unto her principalities and powers, and that we, leading a quiet and peaceful life, may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us also pray for the Queen's most excellent majesty, our Sovereign Lady Elizabeth, and for all presidents, prime ministers, governors, and governors general, senates, senators, legislatures, and judiciaries throughout the whole commonwealth, that all and everyone in their several callings may serve truly and faithfully to the glory of God and to the edifying and well-governing of his people. And herein especially let us pray for the Governor General and for the Senate and House of Assembly of this country. Let us pray as we are bound for all orders of the sacred ministry, and in particular for John, our Archbishop and Bishop of the Diocese, with the bishops and clergy of this province, for all religious communities, especially the community of the resurrection, the Society of St. Francis, the Community of Jesus the Good Shepherd, and the Order of the Holy Cross, all the faithful people of the Church, that the life of the Church militant may be hallowed, her way directed, and her work made fruitful, and to the end that there may never be wanting a sufficient number of persons qualified to serve God in Church and State, let us implore his blessing upon all universities, colleges, seminaries, and schools of sacred and secular learning, particularly upon the University of the West Indies, the College of All Souls, and the University of Oxford, and the University of Durham. And here in this place, we are more especially bound to pray for the good estate of Codrington College, for the principal and the tutors, for all past and present students, and for the domestic and ground staff and others who contribute to the common life, that with their consecration of heart and life, they may labor in the fulfillment of God's purpose. Let us pray for all societies designed to advance the knowledge of the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, particularly for the United Society for the Propagation of the gospel, for the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge, and for the West Indian Church Association. To these our prayers, let us add our praises for mercies already received, for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. And as all of us here are bound to add, for the Christian example and good liberality of our founder, Christopher Codrington, and our benefactors, John Brathwit, William Hart Coleridge, James Wilson, Thomas Henry Leacock, Richard Rawl, Arthur Anstey, Joseph Fort, John Cecil Ripple, and many others, known and unknown, who by their prayers and gifts have supplied what is needful. Finally, let us commend to God's mercy all his servants who are departed hence with the sign of faith, and now do rest in the sleep of peace, and especially our brethren, kinsfolk, and benefactors, beseeching him to grant them his mercy, that at the day of general resurrection, with all them which be of the mystical body of his Son, they may be set on his right hand and dwell with him in life eternal. Wherefore, let us sum up our prayers and praises in the words of our Savior who has taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Very pleasant. Good morning to you all. It's indeed a great joy, pleasure of mine to be here this morning. And I consider it a singular honor to have been invited, being able to accept the kind invitation of the principal to speak on this very special occasion. I bring you greetings from Bishop Boyd, clergy, and good people of the Diocese of the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands. And while they are absent in body, some of them might be watching us by stream. And we thank God for that opportunity. It's so good to be in your company this morning. There's a saying, of course, that a man is known by what? The company he keeps. I'm sure you might have heard of the story of this fellow. Was, I don't know if Dean Dixon told me this one, but this fellow is going home. One night, dead drunk, and he fell down, and he was in the gutter beside this pig. And so this lady passed and said, mm -mm, a man is known by the company he keeps, and the pig got up and walked away. I'm saying all that to say, <laughs> good to be here, <laughs> and as I bring you greetings, please know that as I walk through these hallowed halls, so many fond memories come back to me. Um, I was here from 1971 to 1975. I shared a room with, in the first year anyway, with William Dixon. And I had ordered a non-snoring room from, <laughs> from the Bahamas, but I soon realized that freshmen don't always get what they ask for. But then he redeemed himself by giving me an opportunity on St. Barnabas Day, 1972, to preach what was my first sermon ever at St. Barnabas. So I thank you, my brother, William, very much, and it's so good to see you. As I look around and see the improvements, I just thank God for all that has taken place. The college, of course, has Im impacted many, but I wish that more of us would not only accept that indeed we have a goodly heritage, and that is the theme for our diocese Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands for this year. We have a goodly heritage, build on it. It is incumbent upon all of us who have passed through these hallowed walls to do whatever we can to ensure that we keep this tradition going. There's a saying, we sit in the shade of a tree we did not plant, and we are planting a tree in whose shade we will not sit. We are planting, a, we are sitting under a tree that we did not plant. We are planting a tree in whose shade we will not sit. In that saying, there is continuity, meaning that we have inherited this goodly heritage and we must make sure that it's better off by virtue of our having been here, and by virtue of our having contributed to its continuation into the future. And to this end, I would wish to challenge all of us, old Cods and West Indians alike. As I say that, I check with the principal, and there is a Codrington appeal going on now. And quite frankly, the response thus far has been nothing short of disgraceful. There are too many of us who have passed through these hallowed walls, halls, and we have made absolutely no monetary or any other kind of contribution to show our appreciation for the education, the orientation that we have received in this institution. We like to talk about outside influence and colonization by others. But we are permitting ourselves to fall into that trap if we don't try to fund our own institutions. It's also a disgrace too to see that we have thousands of graduates of UWI 
and so few of us give back at all. I challenge you to do your part. I was speaking with the principal last night. He has about 800 people on his email, his email list. 800 old cards. There are even more. How many of us give? I was speaking to him. I said, what is, might be some of your urgent IT needs, technology needs? He said, it'll cost about 40,000 or so, 40 to 50,000 Barbadian. Those of us who think U.S. could put that in half. That's not much money. Why is it that we aren't making it possible for the students who are here now to be able to get all the cutting edge technology so that they could cope with the challenges that face them. The ball is in our court. And I repeat the adage, we sit in the shade of a tree we did not plant, literally here, and we are planting a tree in whose shade we will not sit. What kind of a tree are we planting? I, I wish to propose that some of us might not have money ourselves, but there are ways in which we can raise funds. For example, I happen to be a singer. I cut CDs and I use the proceeds for the benefit of my home church, St. Philip's, in one of the remote islands in the Bahamas where Archdeacon Everton Weeks was rector at one point. I just I cut that on my 60th birthday five years ago, and I will be 65 and on Monday, so I'll be spending a part of my birthday <laughs> here in Barbados. But I was 40 years as a priest in June of last year, and I had a function. And instead of gifts to me, I asked people to make a contribution to my high school and, again, the church in which I was ordained 41 years ago. And I was able to raise $30,000. Now, you might not be able to raise all of that, but I am putting it to you that if you have uh, special celebrations marking special anniversaries in your life, people would be glad to contribute if you say, for example, that the contributions will be going to your church or better still, for those of us who are old cords, to this noble institution. Let's do it. Let's do it and let us all give in proportion to what we have. In case you think I didn't come to preach, yes I did come to preach. <laughs> and now let us pray. Gracious Holy God, we just thank you for your gift of life, this opportunity to impart your word, and we pray that while it might be spoken through me, they may be your words. Grant, O oh Lord, that I might decrease even as you increase, all to your honor and your glory. Amen. Changing water into wine. That is the theme for this commem exercise. We know the story very well. It is found in, or at least it is a part of the Jesus' first miracle. A wedding was going on, wine had run out, and Jesus came to the rescue. But he didn't just come to the rescue, it happened at the instigation of his mother. And in fact, if we look at what Jesus said to her initially, when she told them that they had no wine, Jesus said, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? In other words, what he's really saying, die your business and it ain't mine. Keep your mouth out of people's business. In whatever country we live, there is always a version of that exhortation. Make sure you, you mind your own business. I'm going to flip that today 
I'm going to say, stop minding your own business, even as you mind God's business. You see, Mary was very comfortable where she was, or at least being a mother, she probably wasn't too comfortable knowing that the wine had run out because she realized what kind of embarrassment that would have been. But yet, she risked being insulted by her son who told her really, get out of those people business. She risked that in order for a miracle to take place. So I'm putting it to us this morning we must stop minding our own business and start minding God's business. I don't know about you, but sometimes I often wonder, or I say to myself, Jesus makes some rather, uh, for the lack of a better word, some silly remarks. <laughs> this might have been one of them, <laughs> in which he spoke to his mother in that kind of a language. The Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was possessed by a demon. She went to Jesus seeking help. What did he say to her, woman? It is not right for the children to eat, for the dogs to eat the children's bread. She said, yeah, that might be true. But isn't it true that they are eating it anyway? He had told her that. He was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. But she insisted. In other words, on her daughter's behalf, it might have been partly her business, but she was seeking out a miracle, knowing the source of all miracles. She wasn't taking no for an answer. And there are sometimes we have to throw off the insults in order to get the blessing and sometimes in order to be a blessing to others. So don't mind if they call you a dog. You know that your blessing lies beyond those words. Similarly, Mary took the same position. In Matthew's version of the feeding of the 5,000, again, kind of off the cuff remark that didn't seem to be too charitable after all. Master, these people are hungry. What should we do? Send them away? Jesus said, you give them something to eat. I guess they probably told Jesus, say, hold on, I don't think you quite understand. You're the boss, you know. <laughs> You're the son of God, you know. Why are you telling us? But that was Jesus' way of inviting the disciples into participation in the ministry and in the miracle. In other words, stop minding your own business. <laughs> And when we start to mind God's business, it's amazing what great miracles can indeed take place. We have human intervention here because they decided that they were not going to mind their own business. Yes, so Jesus took the little that they had. As the cliche goes, a little becomes much when it's in contact with the master's touch. A little becomes much when it's in contact with the master's touch. God wants to work miracles, not so much in turning water into wine anymore, but he wants to work some miracles right through you and me. Needless to say, whenever you are not minding your own business and you're minding somebody else's, we become vulnerable. Of course, we must remember the words of Jesus himself, who even, I guess you might say, some would argue that this might be the formal launch of his ministry while, when he was in the temple as a little boy, when his parents were all about looking for him. So he had some sharp words even from then. Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? Very early, he understood and accepted that. And that is the mandate that we have today. But we become vulnerable. Vulnerable to hurts. Vulnerable to insults. When we stop minding our business and we start to do God's business. Yes, 
But in order for there to be wholeness, in order for God to intervene, sometimes, or very often, it requires our intervention. It requires our leaving our cozy corner and not repeat the words of that well-intentioned song. You in your small corner and I in mine. The gospel doesn't work like that. Now, as I said, the song is well-intentioned. What it really meant is that you do your part there and I do mine here. But ultimately, we are to work together for the common good and for the building up of God's kingdom. And we can't just be doing it like Frank Sinatra sang in 1968, I did it my way. No, indeed we have to do it God's way at every step of the way. So much so that we may be able to echo the words of Jesus who when his disciples came back and saw him obviously hungry but talking to the woman, the Samaritan woman, Ask them about something to eat. He said, I have food to eat that you know not of. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Yes, St. Paul echoes similar sentiments when he said, it is not I who live, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. Again, in all instances, it's reminiscent of the theme that I chose. Stop minding your own business and start minding God's business. Yes, we have to finish the long tradition that has started here. Realizing that we are building, or we're standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before. St. Paul reminds the church at Corinth, I planted, Apollos watered, but what? God gave the increase. Yes, some miracles happen instantaneously. Water into wine. Raising of Lazarus, although it took a little time for Jesus to get there. Others again might take a little longer. And we as pastors or priests sometimes get a little anxious that we are not seeing the fruit of our labor. But if we could just remember that we are a part of a continuum we are a part of a process that continues to unfold. There would be some seeds that we have planted, the fruit of which we will never see. But we must persevere anyway. The battle is not ours. It's the Lord's. And to that extent, we just have to persevere. Bearing in mind that some of the credit that, some of the credit that we take or is given to us is really the result of somebody else who planted a seed in that same parish before us, you know. I'm sure some of us rectors or pastors have heard our predecessor come back and say, boy, uh, what his name is still not coming to church, eh? or still is a wayward person. And you, you take with great joy and say, no man, that person is very faithful now. And of course, you almost want to impute that faithfulness to yourself. But bearing in mind that the same predecessor who was there probably prayed for that person. His mama, his papa, and others would have prayed for that person. And you seem to be reaping the fruit of their labor. I'm saying all that to say, like Martin Luther King said, don't worry about how long your dreams will take. To materialize. The time is going to pass anyway. We just have to continue to be faithful to God, not minding our own business, but persevering to mind God's business. God is indeed working his purpose out. Somehow we get a little despondent when we don't see things working out just right. But we must realize that the ministry in which we are privileged and are called to serve is God's ministry and not ours. When the Blessed Mother 
spoke to a son originally. He said, my hour has not yet come. I'm saying to those who are leaving these hallowed halls, <laughs> to some extent, your hour will not be no longer somebody ringing the bell. In fact, you're responsible for ringing the bell. You will now be at the bottom of the totem pool. You will now be required to do all the menial tasks that the rectors don't want to do anymore. But that's okay. It's a part of the business to which we are convinced you are called. But I want you to know that you are expected to bring a unique and peculiar contribution to the development of the church in this province. A lot has been fed into you over these three or four years, whatever the time frame is. And we expect you not to just sit back and wait for things to happen. As a Gandhi who said, you be the change that you wish to see. And God didn't give you, didn't go on holiday and leave you in charge. I know it's very easy for us young priests to believe that. That we know everything. No. You know precious little. But as time goes on. As you learn from. And contribute to. The life and development of a parish. It's amazing. How great miracles continue to happen. And that is the challenge of course. For all of us. All the priests. To realize that we don't have all the answers. In fact far from it. What used to attract people in our day, 20, 30, 40 years ago, is no longer the case. Arch, uh, the Archdeacon James Springer used to tell us, quoting, a, a house-going pastor makes a home church-going people. Home-going pastor. You visit them, they'll come out. Let's face it. In this day and age, people really ain't want you around their house. I don't know if you prove that. Seriously. People are so busy when they come home, they're about to cook, get the children ready, or go to bed themselves. What? You may say that's the bad news. I ain't the bad news. That's just the natural evolution. But the thing is, we have to find new and different ways to relate to our people. We have to find more creative ways. And I do believe that you graduates, and most of you are what you call millennials, born between what, 1990 or so and 2000, whatever it is. But you bring something unique to the situation. First of all, not some of you would boast that you have no loyalty. <laughs> to any particular institution. And you would find that very symbolic of what is true in the wider society. At one point, it used to be fashionable or the right thing or the honorable thing to be a member of the Anglican Church. Some prestige was associated with that. But let's face it, that is no longer the case. And for some of us who are even pastors, we brought up the children in our denomination and they have found elsewhere to go. Because as far as they're concerned, dad or mom, that's your church, I'm going where the gospel relates to me. And this is where you, the younger priests, must show that you are worthy of the calling that God has given to you. And, of course, to ensure that you use your gifts. And you are permitted to use your gifts. Because the kind of attraction you would have to a certain generation, the older priests would not have that. It is not business as usual anymore. And if you keep thinking the same way you were thinking, if you keep doing the same thing you were doing, then you will keep getting the same things we've been getting. 
And I'm sure you would agree that that's not too good. The Anglican church in this province is losing its share. That's why it's saying the business world, it's market share. That's the bad news. The good news, our God is still on the throne. And I do believe that if we start a new trust, that trend could be reversed. But we have to find new and different ways of attracting and retaining our people. I was in the attic <laughs> over there, and there were many bats <laughs> in the attic. Nothing has changed. <laughs> and the story is told <laughs> of this priest who, these pastors who were talking, they had bats in the church. So one pastor said, how did you get rid of yours? They say, oh, man, I got a buckshot gun. I shot them up, killed plenty, but it really halfway destroyed my church. The other said, well, I put down some poison. They ate that, but the dogs and the cats got poisoned as well. So they're still back. So the other fellow said, he obviously was an Anglican priest. He said, no problem at all, man. I just invited the bishop to confirm them all, and we haven't seen them since. <laughs> that being the case, what are we doing about it? And that's where the Anglican church is really hemorrhaging most. When you're dealing with the, the younger people, the 15 to the 40-year-olds, we must reverse that trend. Like I like to say, if a fella taking your girlfriend, you can find out what kind of cologne you're wearing. <laughs> At least you know. How do they? How are they prospering? How are they attracting others? And we are not. We have become too straight jacketed. That's what it is. Oh. You know, what's, we never did it that way before. Seven last words of a dying church. <laughs> we never did it that way before. Think about it. We have to find new and more creative ways. We have to get out of our comfort zone. Indeed, that comfort zone has really become almost a stranglehold on so many of our parishes. And people are hungry for the gospel in a way that I believe they have never been hungry. Notwithstanding the many distractions that they have, but they still realize ultimately that they need a God. And it is through our effort, through what we do, we pray God that we would be equal to the task. We must engage fully the advancements in technology for that reason, I just reiterated, this thing here is one of the most dangerous, but similarly, it's the best thing that has happened to modern humanity. The choice is ours. Are we going to use it or not? I'm standing here and speaking now. Persons can see me in many parts of the world. Indeed, I'm sure I see a cell phone being held up over there. Some of these pictures are probably already in the Bahamas. How are we using that? Or are we just going to sit back, complain about how the devil is using it? And how the young people are send, sending porn over the, the cell phone? Use it. It is God's business, ultimately. And we must engage in it even more feverishly, even more enthusiastically as the days, months, and years go by. So my brothers and sisters, let me say this. We have indeed a goodly heritage. Let's build on it. God has given us his gift of his son who has commanded us to go out, preach, teach and to baptize. 
How faithful are we to that call? Are we keeping our own little shop? Are we minding our own business? Or are we seeing the ministry entrusted to us as God's business? So let me end where I've started by saying, stop minding your own business and start minding God's business. May he shower his blessings upon us now and forevermore. Amen.